Well, all right, this morning <clears throat> we're in Ezra chapter 5, so we'll read them first and go from there. These are the words of God. <clears throat> now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, rose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? They also asked them this, What are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. This is a copy of the letter that Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and his associates, the governors who were in the province beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent him a report in which was written as follows. To Darius the king, all peace... Be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones and timber is laid in the walls. This work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Then we asked those elders and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this and to finish the structure? We also asked them their names for your information that we might write down the names of their leaders. And this was their reply to us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. And the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought into the temple of Babylon, these Cyrus the king took out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered to the one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to them, Take these vessels, go and put them in the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its site. Then this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundation of the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And from that time until now, it has been in building and is not yet finished. Therefore, if it seems good to the king, let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem. And let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. This is the word of the Lord. Lord God, thank you for uh, your scripture, and we pray that this word would um, have a profound impact on our souls, that you would um, use the the preaching of your holy word to change us and to make us more like Christ, and to help us to trust you and have greater faith in you than we've ever had before. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we are told how the Israelites turned everything around, and they started rebuilding the temple after they stopped. Last week, we saw enemies of God come in, and through a variety of strategies and and ways, they eventually stopped the Israelites from building. And that stoppage didn't last just a few days. It didn't last just a few weeks or even just a few months, but it lasted years and years. The enemies of God and God's people had successfully stopped God's plan for years. And in chapter 5, it starts up again, and it starts... Because God sends his people his word. It starts with a couple of prophets. This morning in chapter 5, we got to see about the prophet Haggai, who we've mentioned already a bunch in this sermon series. We got to see the prophet Zechariah. And, you know, last week I was talking to Chris about how awesome the Bible is. And it's the way, the way it's structured. I mean, it's not, we don't just get history, right? We don't just get to see what happened. Sometimes that's all we get, but sometimes we get to see explanations of why things happen. And, and like, like the book of Ezra, it's just like a newspaper almost. It's like a narrative story, and it's just the facts, right? Like even in our chapter this morning, we, we saw that he says, okay, this is a copy of the letter that they sent, and he just writes down what the, the letter said word for word. It's just like a newspaper of the book of Ezra. 
But God doesn't just leave us with just the facts. He also gives us the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, and he provides their prophecy in the Bible. So we get to see the content of what they prophesied about. I think that is gold. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm weird, but I get excited about that because we get to see what happened, but also we get to see, from God's perspective, an interpretation, an infallible, true interpretation of why it happened and what God thinks about it. I think that's awesome. Now, the prophets of old, you know, the prophets of the Old Testament, what they really did was they preached is what they did. That's what they did. They were preaching. Now, it wasn't exactly the same thing that I'm doing, obviously. So when the prophets preached, they were delivering direct revelation from God to the people. And, and, and I do that as well when I'm reading the Bible word for word. But the prophets also provided a, a God-breathed, infallible interpretation to the people. And so when I interpret the Bible, that's not God-breathed. That could that could be fallible. I could be wrong about things. So what I do and what the prophets do, it's, sl it's different. There's some differences there, but the prophets do preach. That's what they do. God put his own words in their mouth, and so when they went to the people, they preached, and it was God's own word. So that's what Haggai and Zechariah were doing in the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They were preaching. And because we have... The books of Haggai and the books of Zechariah, we get to see some of the content of their preaching. We get to see what their message was all about. Here, here are a few passages I pulled out from the books of Haggai and Zechariah. This is Haggai uh, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house, therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I've called for a drought on the land. So you see Haggai, he preaches, and he says that God is not pleased with what the Israelites are doing. He's not pleased with the people as they mind their own business and they ignore God's business. And the prophet's message is pretty gloomy. God has caused the drought. God has caused these troubles that they're, they're undergoing. But the prophet doesn't end there. His ser that would be a pretty bad sermon if it ended there. Haggai chapter 2. It's only two chapters. But the second chapter is more hopeful. Haggai says, The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. He says, Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig, the tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing, but from this day forth, I will bless you. We get the same kind of pattern in the book of Zechariah, this, a different prophet, but he has a similar method, message for the people. Here's how he starts. He says, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? So it's again, it's a very kind of ominous message to start. But then Zechariah says this at the end of his book. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. That's, you, could, you probably recognize part of that. That's a prophecy about Christ. Christ the King returning to Jerusalem. You can see the concept of victory. You can see promise and hope all over the second half of Zechariah's sermon. He starts off severe, but he, 
He calls his people to repent, and then there's an, a vision of hope for the future. You see, I hope you see the similarities here between what the prophets used to do and what preachers do today. It's, this, is, this is the gospel. This is like when you hear the gospel today. You know, it usually starts with a statement of the fact of sin, rebellion. You have rebelled against God. You are walking away from God, and God is not pleased with that. It's a serious thing. You know, a lot of times when you hear gospel preaching, it's a very serious, solemn thing. You find yourself under the wrath of of God, but it doesn't end there. The prophets, it doesn't end there, and I would never end there. There's always a call to repentance. There's always the call to say, stop rebelling against God. Turn back to God. And it doesn't end there either, because after that happens, there's encouragement to be had. The preaching becomes hopeful. It tells of a glorious future. It tells of salvation. It tells of peace. It tells of prosperity and blessing. That's the message of Haggai. That's the message of Zechariah. And it's the same message today. And you know what? The people in Ezra chapter 5 respond to that message. <clears throat> and it's amazing. They respond almost immediately. Our text tells us that the prophets began preaching at a certain time. And if you uh, match up the dates between what it says in the book of Haggai, for example, what you'll find is that Haggai was preaching for three weeks. And only three weeks later, the work on the temple begins again. That is a quick response. That's amazing. One thing I noticed when I saw this is not only does the work ha start happening quickly, but nothing changed for them from a legal perspective during this time. Like, it's not like the decree of the king had changed and said, okay, guys, you can start again. They were still technically legally banned from working on the temple. There's no indication in the text that Israel's enemies had sort of changed their mind. Like, you know, we were wrong. You could build. There's no indication of that. There's no indication of, of any of the danger that we saw last week. None of that threatening physical opposition. None of that has let up. I think it's safe to say that literally nothing has changed externally for the Jews, but something has changed in their hearts and their souls. And the preaching was responsible for that change. I think when I think about the prophets, maybe you have the same idea, but when I think about the prophets in the, in the Old Testament, I, I think like it sometimes it's almost like a magical, mystical way that it worked, right? Like the prophet's eyes start glowing and they give the people the word of God and like the wind picks up and there's thunder in the distance and, you know, just for effect. And so that's how you really knew it was divine revelation. I mean, their eyes were glowing. That's how it is in my head. You know, I think sometimes, too, the prophets were probably, like, I go, I, I go back and forth. Sometimes I think that they were, like, lunatics, like, on the street corner, just, like, ranting and raving. And sometimes I think that they were, like, super authoritative, the super powerful, booming voices, commanding respect. I go back and forth between those two images of these prophets. But I bet you I'm wrong on both counts. I bet you most of these prophets, it was just standard preaching. Run-of-the-mill, standard preaching. Now, that's not to say they didn't preach with authority. I think they preached with authority, but it was still just preaching. I think they preached with conviction, but it was still just preaching. I think that Haggai and Zechariah and all these guys, they preached with faith, but it was still just preaching. And that's not a bad thing. There is great power in preaching when you're preaching the word of God because God gives it power. Now, in the book of Corinthians, Paul reminds the people of the church of Corinth. He says that the message that he preached wasn't flashy. Like, it wasn't super profound or complex. It was just preaching. Corinthians chapter 2 starts off like this. It says, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. See, so he's saying that, the preaching, he was, it wasn't complex. It wasn't like super profound sounding. It wasn't like insightful or high-minded. But it was simple. He goes on. Paul says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
I think this is how prophets and preachers of God operate. It's not like they all have tremendous oratory skills. I think some of them probably did. It's not because they had glowing eyes, at least not all of them. There was that weird thing with Moses. But they didn't all glow. <laughs> they didn't, I, I don't think that all the prophets had advanced rhetor, rhetoric training. Some of them maybe they did, but I don't think all of them did. Because none of that matters to God. Because God's the one who gives the message its power. And so they don't need to be super skilled in order to have power in their preaching. Now, obviously, we should, I mean, I, I try to be as persuasive as possible when I preach or when I talk to somebody. And you should, too. I think there's nothing wrong with practicing rhetoric and practicing, um, you know, evangelism and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that. So when you're talking to your children or your friend or anyone, yeah, it's okay to read books about how to do that. You want to be as attractive, you want to be as convincing as possible. But understand that the response that you get doesn't depend on your skill alone. In fact, the response that you get is entirely within God's power instead of yours. Don't think that the people in Ezra chapter 5 changed their mind in just three short weeks because Haggai and Zechariah were just super persuasive. <clears throat> Don't think that they went from complete fear and, and selfishness to action and humility in such a short time because Haggai was just so profound. Look, you can read Haggai's prophecy or Zechariah's prophecy, and it's basic stuff. It's not, it's not mind-blowing. It's, it's basic, but it's true. And God caused it to have power, and it caused, he, God caused the message to hit its mark when he wanted it to. So don't worry about how smart you are when you're telling someone about the gospel. Because that doesn't matter much in the grand scheme of things. Don't worry about how clever your arguments are or how persuasive your arguments are. Because in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't matter very much either. Also, don't worry about how you feel. I think this, you know, Paul, I, I get so much encouragement out of this. Paul, he says when he first came, comes to Corinth, he says that he came in weakness, fear, and trembling. I imagine that's probably how Haggai came. I, I imagine that's probably how Zechariah also came. I imagine that's probably how lots of you guys feel when you have a conversation about, about Christ with your family members or your friends or your coworkers. And that's completely fine. That's completely fine. In fact, I think, according to this verse from Corinthians, it's almost like that's how God wants it. It says here, it says, I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling. Why? Well, he explains why. He says, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So if you're fearful and weak and trembling as you share the gospel with anyone, take heart. Because at least the way I understand Corinthians, that seems to me like it makes you qualified to do it. So let's move on for a second because I want to talk about the response of the people because I think this is so interesting. And, and You know, Haggai and Zechariah, they preach for three weeks. All of a sudden, they start working on this temple again. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's like immediate, you get the opposition coming right back. The Persian officials, they're curious. Why are you guys working on this temple? And in verse 3, they, it's funny, they challenged the people. They said, who gave you the decree to build this house? And they want to know their names, too. That's, that's a veiled threat, I would say. They want to know who's responsible for this. Now, I don't know if it's these Persians were just more agreeable or maybe just more reasonable. I don't know if maybe the, the Israelites just had more resolve this time around. I don't know what it was. But when they get challenged this time... The work doesn't stop. The work doesn't stop. So they're challenged. They know that, 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 that the king, uh, king Artaxerxes told them to stop officially by decree, and they stopped. He didn't reverse that decree, and so it's still in effect, and they just start working. And then they get challenged, and they continue working. Interesting. Here's what the Bible says about why the work is continuing. 
Verse 5 says, The eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them till the report should reach Darius and the answer be returned. You see, God responds to the people's obedience. And God responds to their obedience with protection and favor in the face of the opposition. Notice that God doesn't eliminate the opposition. Like, we have to understand that it's completely within God's power to, like, maybe have the Persian authorities distracted and not notice them, or maybe even have them not care that they're building the temple, or even make them fear. God can do any of that, but he doesn't. He allows the opposition to come right to them directly. But then he shows his people favor in the face of that opposition. What, what an encouraging line. The eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them. I found it interesting when I was reading this that the, stra- the strategy the Israelites use, they write a letter to the king, and they, you know, what, what they do in this letter, I find it very comical. I don't know if it's intended to be funny, but I found it funny. What they do is they, they write to the king, and they explain the situation, and they say, get them to search the archives and find the decree made by Cyrus. And they conveniently leave out the other part about the decree about Artaxerxes, where he told them to stop. Now, I find that funny because that's what the enemies of Israel did just in the last chapter. They, remember, they told the king, they said, search the archives to find out about how rebellious these people are. And they conveniently left out the part about Cyrus allowing them to go build this temple. So the Israelites used the same strategy in reverse. Which I believe I, when I read that, I was like, oh, that's, that must be, be what that prophet in the New Testament was talking about when he said, you should be as shrewd as vipers, but as innocent as doves. You see, you should be strategic and clever, but don't sin while you're doing it. And of course... The prophet who said that was Jesus Christ. You see, this thing, we, we have such an advantage today over the Israelites in Ezra chapter 5. Because we get the prophecy, we see the prophecy more clearly and more completely. So when I preach repentance and faith, just like Haggai did, and when I preach about the future, the future glory that awaits the people of God, just like Haggai and Zechariah do, I can preach a lot clearer than they can. Even though they had direct revelation from God and they were speaking God's own words, they were doing it in a much less detailed way than we can do it today. And the reason we have this advantage is because Jesus Christ, the true prophet, came and explained things to us so clearly. Earlier I said that part of the prophet's job was to interpret history. They, they would tell you why things happened, what they meant, and what the future would be like. Jesus, of course, did that too. But Jesus actually interpreted something far more important. He interpreted God. John 1.17, we said it all together. We said, for the law, law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now that last bit, he has made him known. You may have seen my video. That comes from one word, one Greek word, exegesitus. And that's the word where we get exegesis. So literally what this verse is saying is that Jesus Christ exegetes God to us. He explains God to us. He interprets God to us. You see, Jesus Christ is the ultimate prophet. And so let's respond to him as the Israelites respond to Haggai and Zechariah. We'll respond with confidence and faith and obedience. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for giving us so much insight into the events of Ezra chapter 5 through the books of Haggai, through the books of Zechariah. Thank you for sending your prophets to your people consistently in many different ways, in many different times. Thank you for making sure your message was clearly delivered. You didn't have to send prophets. You could have just left us where we were, but you did send prophets because you loved us that much. But God, as much as we thank you for the prophets that you sent, as much as we thank you for the preachers over the years, 
We thank you so much more for your son because he explained it all to us, God. He explained it clearly to us. He helps us to understand you. He helps us to understand who you are. And so we're grateful for that. So, Lord, I just pray that, you know, maybe we think about um, your son as differently than we have before, Lord, in a, in a way that we understand that, that he is the ultimate prophet. That he not only explains history, but he explains the creator of history. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be more like him every day. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.